history will remember Gerald Ford as a man who restored the honor and integrity of the, of the Oval Office of the White House. Well, he was, uh, a, um, I think, a national treasure. I think he saved the country. In fact, he saved it in such a matter-of-fact way that he isn't given any credit for it. I, Gerald R. Ford, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. The office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of my ability. And will, to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. President. Gerald Ford's rise to power as our 38th president is unprecedented in American history. It ended the nation's worst constitutional crisis since the Civil War. My fellow Americans, our long national nightmare is over. Gerald Ford was an accidental president. The remarkable circumstances that brought him to the White House were an American tragedy and traumatized the nation. What Gerald Ford did to end the pain and heal the country remains his enduring legacy. It's the story of a man from Grand Rapids who believed in honest, simple virtues, that hard work brings good luck, and that truth is the glue that holds government together. Hello, I'm Matt McLogan. Chances are, if you're under 40, you have little recollection of Gerald Ford's life or his political odyssey. But for those who grew up observing his pilgrimage from Omaha to Grand Rapids to Washington to the White House, there is reminiscence and nostalgia because Gerald Ford turned 90 on July 14th. He joins in longevity just three other former presidents, Herbert Hoover and John Adams, who lived into their 90s, and Ronald Reagan, who's 92. During the height of the Watergate scandal with Richard Nixon under siege, America was looking for an honest man and found it in Gerald Ford. And America discovered that Ford inherited some of his most admirable qualities where he grew up, here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. To me at least, and I'm sure to others, he embodied really the best American qualities. He had not spent all of his life trying to become president. He wasn't obsessed with what the latest public opinion poll said. He wanted to serve his country. He wanted to do the right thing. Doing the right thing was a recurring theme throughout the life of Gerald R. Ford. It would make a fitting epitaph. But he was not born a Ford. He was born a King, Leslie King Jr. in Omaha, Nebraska in 1913. Ford's father was a wool merchant from Wyoming, and as it turned out, an abusive husband. Dorothy Gardner King eventually left her husband and fled with her infant son to the seclusion of Grand Rapids. It was here that she met and married the man who was everything her first husband was not. Disciplined, gentle, self-confident, a man of his word, and respectful of a lady. Core values the future president would learn growing up in Grand Rapids. He was the father I grew up to believe was my father, Ford would write. He was the father I loved and learned from and respected. He was my dad. Jerry Ford's parents had three rules. Tell the truth, work hard, and come to dinner on time. Look at telling the truth. Uh, when you think about that, when I think about it, uh, trustworthiness, honesty, honor, decency, respect, and it still comes down to one word, integrity. And that's the kind of upbringing he had uh, from his parents in terms of that rule. As a career politician, Ford would honor two of his parents' three rules because it wasn't always possible to come to dinner on time. Gerald Ford's Grand Rapids boyhood was the stuff of legend and legacy. I was as happy a young man as you could find, he said. The story seems ordinary, like the boy next door. But for the man who would become president, 
It is also extraordinary. An all-state athlete at Grand Rapids South High School. An exemplary Eagle Scout who lived by his values, tell the truth, play by the rules. A mentor to his three half-brothers and a hero to his mother. He was the son his birth father met only twice in his life, but the son his stepfather loved all his life. Ford was a scholar and a football star at the University of Michigan who believed that you should win if you can, and if you lose, try again. He was so good that he was offered professional football contracts with both the Green Bay Packers and the Detroit Lions. They didn't think about playing professional football. You know, that was not their goal. They were not professional athletes. Uh, they were student athletes and were part of the university and part of the community. And some of, some of those values, I'm sure, came out of the notions of sportsmanship and, and behavior uh, and hard work uh, at, at the U of M. At Yale Law School, Jerry Ford was someone to watch. As a young Grand Rapids attorney, he was someone worth watching and worth trusting. As a Navy ensign in World War II, Gerald Ford learned that international borders reached far beyond provincial Grand Rapids. And as a budding politician with a wide view of the world, Ford was eager for a career in public service. When he was first running, uh, he was an internationalist back from World War II, and he was running against the old isolationist arm of the Republican Party. So he had a cause. He was very straightforward by, about pushing it, and he worked hard. He must have shaken the hand of 90% of all the voters. Ford ran for and won a seat in Congress, which he held for a quarter century. And that wasn't his only victory. In 1948, Ford won the hand of Betty Bloomer Warren of Grand Rapids. Their mutual love and loyalty would reverberate all the way from Grand Rapids to the White House and beyond, through good times and bad. I have not campaigned either for the presidency or the vice presidency. I have not subscribed to any partisan platform. I am indebted to no man and only to one woman, my dear wife. As congressman from Michigan's 5th District, Ford became Grand Rapids' favorite son and in time, House Minority Leader. Ford aspired to only one higher office. Jerry Ford loved the house. He was con considered himself a man of the house. He always told me he aspired primarily to be Speaker of the House of Representatives. Uh, that wasn't to be. He wasn't there very long when all uh, Republicans had the majority. But he loved the House of Representatives and he was very good at it. And uh, it shaped his, I think, his political persona. Uh, he loved the debate, the give and take of debate. You could have arguments about policy within the administration and the Oval Office around the cabinet table. But with a firm Democratic majority, it never happened. Ironically, something else did. My fellow Americans, I proudly present to you the man whose name I will submit to the Congress of the United States for confirmation as the Vice President of the United States, Congressman Gerald Ford of Michigan. With the sudden resignation of Spiro Agnew, Nixon's Vice President, congressional investigators, dominated by Democrats, probed Ford's background. What they found was a flawless Eagle Scout from Grand Rapids. He's an Eagle Scout, and he lived by being an Eagle Scout. That's the truth. I mean, there are a lot of us, I guess, that we're in scouting, but never really lived up to it, but he did. And his personal values were honesty and uh, straightforwardness and uh, compassionate republicanism, which we didn't have the word for then, but he really exemplified it. On December 6, 1973, the House of Representatives, whose members knew and admired Gerald Ford, voted overwhelmingly to confirm him as our nation's first unelected vice president. The previous month, the U.S. Senate had voted 92 to 3 in favor of Ford's confirmation. But with the Watergate scandal already dominating Washington and the nation by then, many in Congress thought they might well be selecting the next president of the United States. 
I've, I've covered the White House for almost 30 years now, every president starting with Nixon. And frequently people will say, which of the seven presidents have you covered was the most fun for you to cover? And I always say the most fun I've ever had in this business was covering vice presidents, not presidents. And the vice president who was fun to cover was Jerry Ford. Jerry Ford was a reassuring vice president. He spent most of his time traveling on behalf of Republican candidates and in defense of Richard Nixon. Watergate began to consume Ford, and it exhausted the nation. He tried really hard to balance his own personal misgivings about some of the things that were going on at the White House with a sense of, of needing to be loyal to his president and to try to do whatever he could to, to hold the country together in a very difficult time, and it was very tough. On August 9th, 1974, it was over. Watergate had changed everything, Therefore, I including the lives of Jerry and Betty Ford forever. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president at that hour in this office. Within minutes of Nixon's resignation, the new president, Gerald Ford, was at work in the White House. President Ford came to the Oval Office with a, with a reservoir of respect. And I think, I think the characteristic that helped him most was his blatant, his open uh, honesty and integrity. The remarkable thing about Ford was he was absolutely calm. He didn't, he was not nervous. He didn't say, this has fallen on me, what am I going to do? Uh, uh, he had a chance to serve his country. He didn't brag, he didn't boast, he knew what he could do. He knew what he needed help on. He had no complexes. And uh, from the first moment, it was a joy to work with him. My fellow Americans, we have a lot of work to do. My former colleagues, you and I have a lot of work to do. Let's get on with it. Getting on with it was easier said than done. The fallout from Watergate and Richard Nixon's problems exhausted Ford's young presidency. For the good of the nation and the Nixons, Ford pardoned the ex-president, an act that would polarize America from Washington all the way to Ford's hometown. We thought that was a mistake. We acknowledged that uh, that uh, it served to, to unify the country again, and it was important and useful in that sense. But we also thought that uh, it was not a very good lesson to say that uh, misdoings in high places were somehow different from, from others. So, I mean, and we wrote as much. We wrote an editorial. I wrote it myself. There was an absolute storm of protest. Not only was we, were we being unfair to, uh, to Jerry Ford, but we were being unfair to Grand Rapids, and because he was from here, and probably damaging the Western civilization. You know. uh, but it just pointed up the fact that uh, uh, if you have a president of the United States from your hometown, the relationship with hometown newspapers is a little different than uh, if you're writing about somebody from New England. He was right on the uh, pardon, and it may well have cost him the presidency. He believed very deeply that um, after a month of wrestling with the problems of the pardon and seeing the extent to which it was dominating everything that he did, uh, the question of what would happen to, to Nixon, that uh, he needed to go forward with the pardon. And he did it because he thought it was the right thing to do, I think knowing full well at the time that it was going to be extremely costly from a political standpoint, that the politic thing to do would have been to duck it. But he didn't do that. Uh, he showed, I think, great courage and determination in doing what he believed was right for the country, even at considerable political cost to himself. I think he was shocked, as I was, at the dramatic drop in support. I mean, he had 70 percent approval or something, and after that it went down to 35 or 40 and never recovered. So the whole presidency was changed by the pardon, but I still think it would have been better than if we had not had a pardon and had to spend a large part of our time on the Watergate problem. 
He is convinced to this day that it was the right thing to do. It was the only way to, to bring closure to the, the horror of Watergate. And he would do it again, I think. But I, but I don't think he thought that it was going to end his presidency that particular Sunday. Gerald Ford was president for 895 days. And while the pardon often overshadows his accomplishments, history has been kind to Mr. Ford. He healed the nation, and he restored legitimacy and trust to the office of President of the United States. The full measure of Ford's record is impressive despite the shadow of Richard Nixon. He took the country through and out of one of the worst recessions since the Great Depression. Ford moved the U.S. economy back to growth and prosperity. He brought closure to America's involvement in Vietnam. He negotiated and signed the Helsinki Treaty that opened the way for growth and democracy in communist East Europe. And he traveled extensively, ensuring our allies and our adversaries that he was there to do the best that he could for America and the world. He established what I believe was the closest relationship of any American president in any uh, post-war period, and probably in any period, with the European leaders. And he did it by his special qualities, openness, intelligence, directness, and what's even more remarkable is that they have remained friends of his after he left government. Gerald Ford's White House will also be remembered for its candor. America was smiling again. Ford brought a transformation to the presidency based on humility, honesty, and yes, humor, intended or otherwise, even on the golf course. The only joke I can ever remember that he told in his speeches was how he was playing with Bob Hope and Bob Hope got a birdie and on the next hole he was up with his wild drives and he got an elk and an elephant or <laughs> something like that. <laughs> he was very popular uh, with reporters, uh, even those who occasionally wrote critical things about him. Uh, and I think that's, that's in, again, indicative uh, uh, of, of his personality. The press loved him. You know, he was, he was, uh, he was approachable. Uh, he never carried a grudge. Uh, he was very loyal to his friends. Um, he, he, you know, the old cliche about uh, you're known by, by the enemy, by your enemies, but you're also known by your friends. The value of friends was never more apparent than during Betty Ford's battle with breast cancer and later substance abuse. Her struggles galvanized America and brought a new self-awareness to women and men around the world. And with Ford's politics, there were disappointments. We had a long, hard-fought contest with uh, then-Governor Reagan, which we won. Last time, Ronald Reagan lost anything, I think. And, uh, and it was a good, healthy competition. And then, of course, we went on to the general election and in a very, very close election where we came from way back, uh, we couldn't quite pull it out. Jimmy Carter beat us by a very narrow margin. Uh, that was a disappointment. I really felt that if there was a man who had earned the right to govern for another four years based on his performance, that uh, Jerry Ford was that man. But uh, unfortunately, uh, it wasn't to be. We came up just a few votes short. What President Ford had going for him, uh, in an almost insurmountable way, was the gratitude of the nation for his own administration, as brief as it was, uh, for absolute integrity and of uh, restoring the uh, faith of Americans uh, in the White House itself and in the government. President Ford healed this nation to a great degree. And had he not had to assume some of the inherited responsibilities left over from the Nixon administration, I think he would have been invulnerable to any sort of challenge uh, from me or within the Republican Party. Gerald Ford would be the first to tell you that growing up in a community that prides itself on virtue and goodness made all the difference for his appointment with history. Throughout his political life, Gerald Ford remained connected to Grand Rapids. It's a place that made its mark on its most famous citizen, and he on it. 
Some have called Gerald Ford ordinary, but for a man called upon to serve America in extraordinary times, it's now the common view that he met the challenges he faced head on and succeeded. I wish the people I knew President Ford as closely as I know him, as intimately as I know him, uh, because they would, they would sense the, the innate decency of the man. I would say that all the qualities that made President Ford such a formidable uh, opponent in the political arena, that uh, the most important would be his own personal integrity. Nobody ever doubted that when he spoke it was a truth. I cannot think of a more important three-year period in the last 50 years than the one in which Ford took us from crisis to stability. Without question, this country has obviously got somebody up there who's looking after us. And he had, uh, I don't know who else could have done with what he did at that time. But those values, the Midwestern values, Grand Rapids values, whatever you want to call them, he never forgot where he came from. Uh, you know, he loved being the congressman from then the 5th District of Michigan. And uh, I will always remember an event that occurred here in Grand Rapids on the uh, election day of 1976. And we uh, came in the night before, as was traditional on election day, spent the night here in Grand Rapids, got up the next morning, he went and voted. Then he always had breakfast at the same restaurant uh, with a group of friends. And then we got uh, in the cars and went out to the airport. And on our way out of town, we dedicated the mural. There's a big mural on the wall out there of President Ford and his family. And on the wall are, are paintings of his mother and his father. And uh, it was one of the most emotional moments I ever experienced with the president for him. Uh, he got very emotional about it. Um, the staff all did, the press did. Alan Thomas was crying. I mean, it was one of these events that just captured uh, sort of the essence of who Jerry Ford was and where he was from and, and how much his character and his life had been shaped by these people who were so important in his, his mother and his stepfather. I have been with Gerald Ford hundreds of times. I've had dozens of interviews and it's amazing in going over some of this material over the last 30 years how certain things you forget but certain things that were totally insignificant at the time just kind of pop into your head and one thing that uh, popped into my head a couple of years ago was an incident that got no attention uh, on the evening news. It was during the primaries of 1976 and he was in Florida. He was on a bus tour of Florida and uh, he was making some remarks at a shopping mall in Boca Raton, Florida. And he got caught out in a downpour and he got totally drenched. His hair was slicked down. It looked like his hair looked like the top of an aircraft carrier. He just got caught out in the rain. And and he he in two minutes, I think, just had a couple of quick remarks and it said a lot about who he was. I can remember him saying, uh, I want to apologize for my appearance. He says, but you know, there's an old saying, aristocracy is of the soul, not of the cloth. And so I don't look like a very good president right now, but I think I'm a darn good president. And I just thought, in a small way, it kind of captured the humility of the man and the essence of who he was. And it's always been one of my, one of my favorite anecdotes. And I've finally found the document in the weekly compilation of presidential documents and put it on my bulletin board. And, uh, when my seven-year-old is a little older, I'm going to read it to him because I think it was a nice little summation of, uh, of Gerald Ford, the man. President Ford is an unspoiled character. Some would say he suffered from too much common sense. He would say he was simply doing the best he could for America. And when America was looking for an honest man who told the truth, during one of our country's greatest turning points, it found integrity in Gerald Ford and he had found it in Grand Rapids. This was the community that nurtured Gerald Ford, that taught him to tell the truth, to work hard, and come to dinner on time. Gerald Ford turning 90. Happy birthday, Mr. President. I'm Matt McLogan. Thanks for watching. I once asked you for your prayers, and now I give you mine. May God guide this wonderful country, its people, and those 
they have chosen to lead them. May our third century be illuminated by liberty and blessed with brotherhood, so that we, in all who come after us, may be the humble servants of thy peace. Amen. Good night. God bless you.